entire church family and anybody who listens, I'm posting this sermon because it speaks to me, it spoke to me. I had a rough week and I went to bed at about 10 o'clock on Saturday night and I woke up at 2 a.m. on Sunday morning and uh, the sermon just seemed to come from elsewhere. And even as I preached it, I was listening to myself and thinking, maybe God made me become a minister because that way I will actually listen to the sermons and think about them. So it spoke to me. I pray it speaks to you. Be blessed. The theme, the theme is called Worship with Rejoicing. And I'm like one of those, I'm going to tell you about how much of a nerd I am just now, but I always like to give credit to my sources. I am using a website uh, that, that helps me to uh, come up with sermons and things. Uh, it's based on the lectionary. It's very helpful. But the other good thing about it, if uh, you go to that link, I've sent you guys an email of the link to that place, is there's also Bible studies and other discussion uh, topics around the topics that I'm going to be talking about on a Sunday. So I'm going to send that to you again soon. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, we pray. Amen. Oops, I forgot about the thoughts of my heart. So we'll pray for those two, but covered. So today's uh, theme is called to confession. And it follows the order of our normal Sunday worship. We start with gathering. And to think about that, you guys, I'm super impressed because it was pouring down. And you're not even Baptists, but you're here. And you came through the rain. You made it. Well done. Gathering for worship is something that happens. There's uh, Pete the drummer. Where's Peter? Peter says his neighbor thinks he's a minister because every Sunday he leaves early and drives to church and the neighbor's starting to say, like, are you a pastor? Um, I hope that, that people ask all of you that question, are you a pastor? Because I see that, that you're always on your way to church every Sunday morning. And... Uh, Back in the days, you know, it was such a physical sign in, in towns, in places that you would just see people moving to church on a Sunday, a, a gathering for worship. And then in worship, we spoke about a call to worship, the call to, to pay attention to God and the call to have communion in his presence. I spoke about that line that Jesus spoke to his disciples, come with me to a quiet place and rest for a while. That call to, to just how to soak in God's presence, to come and restore yourself in God's presence because you need it. It's, it's not just being called to awe and wonder because God is so great, but being called to God's comfort and God's strength. So we move through these movements in worship from gathering, from being called, from being called to confession. Next week we'll talk about the might and power of the word that we listen to in the scriptures. We'll talk about our prayers of the people, the intercessions that we pray. Finally, the benediction, which I'm worried about saying it to you because you all leave when I start saying, and now may the grace of our Lord, then next thing you're having tea or something. So I won't say anything like that. But I always say that if you want to get rid of a Methodist, just stand up and say, and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're talking about call to confession. And I have to confess to you that I am a nerd. I don't know if, it's, if the right word is nerd, but I, in all my school life, I might have got detention once. I don't know about you. I never got, in my days it was a cane, and I was laughing one day because there was a nasty teacher at my school. And uh, he was about this high. But when I wasn't this high, he was pretty large. And he loved his little stick. And I found myself, this, this guy, standing behind him in the queue at Woolworths one day. <laughs> I had some bad thoughts. I sort of wanted to say hello. <laughs> I thought that's why he liked his cane so much. 
But I, I hate doing the wrong thing. I, I hate it. Like, if I cut you off in traffic and you hoot at me, I will think about it till tomorrow. Because I don't mean to t- cut you off in traffic. I don't think about it. But I've been uh, going through all this rain, getting my, my son to school in the morning, and I'm amazed at how people will drive past 10 cars waiting in the queue and then just beep, drive in. Like, what I like about my car is it's a senior car. It has many bumps and scratches. Then I feel a little bit less nerdy. I think, well, maybe a little bump on your 2 million rand Mercedes will teach you a lesson. I don't know why I am so well behaved. I think maybe it is because and I don't know if this is the right language, but my brother and sister were bloody naughty. Excuse, delete that from the record. Bishop, if you're watching the service, my humble apologies. They are seven years older than me, and so when I was five, they were 12. When I was six, they were 13, which is a significant... Now I know why it's an unlucky number. It's just teenagerhood. They were naughty, so naughty that they, went, they were eventually sent off to, to, to boarding school, to, to Kingswood, where Andrew at the back went, because they, we, my mom and dad just decided that they, they needed the, the structure. And they had a good time, and they're not naughty anymore, but I'm still the nerd. I won't tell you anymore. This is, this is a problem. So, I don't know about you nerds, but I got my EMP what, 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 and then you have to file your taxes. I scrick when I file my taxes because I'm afraid I might get it wrong. And so I, I fill in all the stuff, and for the last four years running, and I have to celebrate that this year, I did the last four years running, it said, you've been chosen for a random audit. I was like, four years, guys, that's not random. And then I know that all my stuff is right. I know that I've checked it and double-checked it. I use a, a clever app that helps me to fill in my taxes. I know it's right, but then for two months, while they send me stuff about what documents they need, I know it's not going to happen, but I think the cops are going to rock up and knock on my door to take me away because I forgot to report that receipt for a watermelon or something. I don't know. So, I don't want to traumatize you too much, but there's the picture, isn't it? (laughs) So, uh, let me take that one away so you don't feel traumatized. Oh, sorry, man. Um, Hang on. Oh. (laughs) Uh. Sorry, man. <laughs> okay. I feel a bit more calm now. Whew. I hope you're not afraid of dogs. The good news is that this year, like I said, I didn't have to uh, submit that tax return. And I didn't spend that time, I mean that audit, what, what, didn't have to wait for that. They just paid me enough money to put some diesel in my tank. And uh, I didn't have to call any lawyers. I keep thinking when I'm I've, when I've waiting for them to cut back with my audit, I think the, the following lawyers in the congregation might be able to help me. I am, maybe I'm a nerd, maybe I'm anxious or whatever. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to traumatize you guys again. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. There's an, a non-allergic cat. You can relax again. Now, again with SARS, uh, my wife got the notice that she got auto-assessed. And she owes SARS 15, one five rand. My wife works for the government. She is a government-employed school teacher. Don't they understand how like, money comes back and forth, you know? You could have figured that out between you guys. Fifteen bucks. So anyways, 
We'll save up until we can pay it. But this is serious stuff, and I just wanted to give you some life, light relief and, and just talk about being called to confession. And, and sometimes I think that I'm such a nerd that maybe I don't need to confess. Or maybe actually my eagerness to please everybody, my, my decision to, to not upset people, is actually a sin that I must confess because I am not called to comfort the comfortable. I'm called to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. You don't have to like me. I sometimes will make rulings that you don't like. I'll sometimes say to you, church, that's not good enough. Do better next time. And you will go, oh, Angus is never happy with us. He's such a grumpy guy. Just wait. I'm not a grumpy guy. Wait, you, I'll show you a grumpy guy. Anyways. David. Oh, my David. David, David, David. The golden boy. Here in Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, we see how the trouble starts. He has become an ivory tower kind of guy. I love our politicians. I, I think that some, now don't get me wrong, I think that some sort of national health something is a fantastic idea, just as I think government schooling is a fantastic idea, but I would love to see politicians' kids in uh, government schools. This is David's story, isn't it? He's remaining in Jerusalem. And then you hear politicians saying, when I am in parliament, I will not get government medical aid. And the next thing I hear them on the radio, yeah, but it's actually in the South African law that if you're a member of parliament, you have to have uh, the GEMS health cover. It's actually a, an article in the law, so I can't uh, not have medical aid. So I, prayed, uh, I said I wasn't going to get medical aid when I was in government. I was going to fix the health system, but unfortunately I have to go to MediClinic uh, because uh, I don't want don't to take up space in much-needed beds here and there. He remained in Jerusalem. He sent off his soldiers to battle, and he chilled at the castle and spied on soldiers' wives. That uh, trailer I showed you is, is the way people used to think of David and, and you know, Poor David, he's so in love with that woman. Oh my goodness, poor David. But it happened, it said in my translation. My Bible is a bit ruder than, than, than the NRV. This is the New Revised Standard Version, which is a little closer to the Hebrew, but it uses some strange words sometimes. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch. So we, it's not at night he was getting up from his sleep like he was you know, sleeping at night, he was dosing on his couch in the afternoon, like me. Like, I've got a lacquer couch in the other room there, and sometimes you think I'm here, I'm actually just having a snooze. And he was walking about the roof on the king's house, and he, he saw, imagine, it's supposed to be like... He saw from the roof, a woman bathing, and she was very beautiful. What a creep, folks. What a creepy, freaky, dicky dude. It's disgusting. Michelangelo's David is a beautiful... Look at him. I, uh, I didn't know whether I should do the star or not. And that is not the star of David, just so you know. <laughs> now, an oak who chills on his couch in the afternoon, I can speak from experience, who has enough uh, money to have people bring him delicious food, does not look like a gym bunny. No, no, no. Maybe more like me. He was about 50 years old now, this guy. He was chilling on his couch, and he probably looked like a Methodist minister. 
not a Springbok rugby player. Like one that goes to visit people's houses and then they give him cookies. And he eats the cookies because he can't not eat cookies. Not because he doesn't like cookies, it's just because when he sees cookies, he eats them. So rather put out some carrot sticks. Let me calm you after those images again. So you want to get that out of your head. I don't know what you want to do. I just want to set the scene of creepy David checking out his soldiers' wives from the top of the castle. Not like people used to tell the story of Gregory Peck and Susan Hayward. Look at her. She's like, David. Poor David. He's being seduced. The Hollywood version does what Hollywood does to those horrible things. Did, the other day I saw a movie, like I thought, that was a funny movie that I watched when I was a kid, you know. It's only age-restricted 2 to 13. Let me watch it with my kids. And next thing, like every five minutes, someone's grabbing, a, a man is grabbing a woman and <laughs> mooching her, and then she's, she's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, and then she's like, oh, yes. It's like, oh, Hollywood, man. Terrible. Poor innocent David is the whole story. What a load of rubbish. He's a lazy king enjoying being a lazy king. He sent his messengers to get her. What can she do if the king's messengers come to get you? He, the word for it is rape. This is no romantic story. And the reason we present it like that in history and preaching is we didn't think too much about the fact that uh, David's a bit of a Harvey Weinstein. Ugh. Because as a church, as a people, confession isn't something we like to do. We don't like to confess that David the king is a creep. We like to pretend that David the king is some poor innocent victim of of. Of a, of a woman who was so careless as to bath on the roof of her house. We failed to confess the fact that we're a mess. David keeps getting off the hook. I cannot say the name, but the 45th president of the U.S. is, is compared to poor David because shame, he was seduced by Stormy Daniels. And Christians, all around the world think that he's some kind of a savior. He has no conscience, no sense of any guilt for doing anything wrong because we've developed a kind of Christianity that is often confessionless. I've often been asked by non-Methodist kind of people that I always, and Anglicans and Methodists and Catholics, and I don't want to say normal churches, but for me it's normal churches. We start our service with a confession. Uh, we have not done your will, we've messed up, etc., etc., because we are, are, are acknowledging the fact that we're a mess as people, as individuals, as a church. We're, we, we are what inspired the most helpful program for people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. My name is Angus and I'm a sinner. Hello, Angus. And then you can tell me your name and remind me that you're a sinner too. Maybe that's how I should have got you to greet each other this morning when you said hello. I realize though that I'm not such a nerd. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to suddenly confess a whole lot of nonsense to you. Uh, I do that in private with my friend. But I can judge creepy David for his adultery because I haven't got the energy for standing up on the roof looking for people having a bath. I'm sorry. I have a busy life. <laughs> I judge people who sin differently to the way I sin. You know, we always think that God judges those people who sin differently to you. I sin. I'm probably not as aware of what my sins are 
as I ought to be. Jesus says I must check for the log in my own eye before I start looking for specks in yours. Maybe I pay the people who work for me less than a living wage. In this cold weather, I can lounge on my couch in my house and I have a choice of three different dogs to keep me warm. Not only do I have three dogs, but those dogs eat well, let me tell you. They eat better than many humans. Nelson Mandela famously said he would never have a pet because he doesn't understand how you could be feeding an animal when you are, when there are people dying in the streets of hunger. Maybe you could come and see me later and tell me more of my sins for me. Because that's what a Christian community that confesses is about. It's about gently and gracefully taking each other aside and saying, listen, man, you know, it's so hard to say to somebody, even for me, I heard the way that you spoke about your wife and uh, we're Christians in a community. I just don't think you should do that. Would you like it if I said that to you? Hey, man, uh, please stop with the racist jokes. It's like, not cool, man. Oh, Gus is so judgy. I don't know what, what we could say to one another, how you could point out my sins to, to me not in a nasty way, but speaking the truth in love. You really need a honest community. You need a gentle community. You need a graceful community in order to be able to confess that we're a mess. And somehow we need that, that willingness and that vulnerability to say that I could be the problem just as you could be the problem. I guess my conscience is more shaped by my eagerness to please everyone around me than it is shaped by what God wants for me. That's why we're called to confession. That's why we need to confess and we need to be reminded to confess because we all have a little bit of David in us. We just do it differently. David's Stuff starts not, not when it's getting so hectic that she's pregnant and he's having her husband killed and there's all sorts of stuff going on that's ridiculous. It starts when he's lounging around on the couch, chilling out, not doing what he ought to be doing. It doesn't even start when he starts poking his head around the corners to see what's happening. It starts when he just takes his his eye off of what God has called him to, where God has called him to be, what God has called him to do. So from Sunday to Sunday, our opening prayer, you know our desires, you know our hearts, no secrets are hidden from you. We start our service with a prayer, something like that, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit so that we would love you perfectly, O oh God. That our lives, because we bear the name Christian, which means little Christ, would reflect Christ to the world. And people would say, how did you get to be so much like Jesus? I've never met someone as Jesus-like as you. Imagine if the people of the church were Christ-like. And it starts with us saying we're not there yet. It starts with us saying we want to be more like Jesus and we need all the help that we can get. And helping each other is not knocking each other down. It's picking each other up. Later on in the service, I just was looking for a nice prayer of confession and I I plan to make us confess this prayer of confession for a while until it sort of, you know, seeps in and we get soaked in it. Merciful God, we have not loved you with our whole heart. Right at the beginning, 
How about these cutting words? We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. I am one of those whose windows go up as I get to the red light. And isn't it awkward that we don't have money anymore? I'm like, sorry, man. You got snap scan? And I made the mistake of asking a, a, a car guard if he had snap scan the other day. And he did. <laughs> and then I tried to pay with snap scan. And it's, you can't pay less than 20. And now I'm committed. <laughs> Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. We take a moment to pray in silence. Perhaps we sing a song. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then we say to each other, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. We think of prayers of David. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let's not just think that that's some sort of cheap answer to our problems. It is the grace of God that meets us. He forgives us. We are called to confession because we need to remind ourselves that we are works in progress. Be patient. God is not finished with me yet. David's beginning ends with the sin multiplying out like a snowball, ending with him using his office as a king, his office that he holds as a king, his official capacity that has been bestowed on him by the Lord to cause trouble. To kill one of his own soldiers. As soon as it's all over, David's like, hey, come be my wife now. Listen, shame man. You better look after you, trying to make himself look like the goody. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, and he tells the story about an injustice that's been done and invites David to judge between the powerful person and the, and the weak person. And, and David says, oh, could that person do such a thing? And Nathan says, well, that's what you did, David. The conversation ends in verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Seems too easy, doesn't it? But it's not easy. It's not about the difficulty of confessing that I'm a sinner. That's, that's not it. Confessing I'm a sinner is easy too. What God has done for us is not easy. And what God has done for us is give his only son so that we could not die but have eternal life. Your righteousness. You are my one defense. You are my righteousness. I'm a mess, folks. You're a mess. But it's a blessed mess. Aren't you? You're going to disappoint your children, I'm sorry. You're going to disappoint your wife. You're going to disappoint your parents. You're going to disappoint your friends. You're going to disappoint your church. You're going to disappoint yourself a thousand and a thousand times. But Christ's grace is enough. That's why we have the courage to confess. His grace is enough. 
Next week, it's going to get even more complicated. We've gathered for worship. We've called to worship. We've been called to confession. And now we're saying, feed us. The might of the word. The word is like bread for us. We've come finding ourselves weak and and heavy burdened. We, We don't have what we need. And God gives us the bread of communion. God gives us the bread of his word. And the rain. Now I have to keep the crescendo going and I can't go softer. (laughs) That's what Nathan did. He came and he spoke to David and he said, this is how it is. And each of us has that opportunity to look in the mirror of God's word and say, I'm not who I ought to be. And when we do that, we say, well, thank God I have a community that understands that every day is a new beginning. Thank God that I go to a community that says, let us confess our sins. And I realize that I'm not the only one who messed up this week. And then I go out in the grace of God, and I think by the time I've lit the bri or whatever it is you're going to do, that I'll be the good person, but next thing you, I don't know, drop a log on your foot, and next thing you kick the dog. I don't know what happens. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen.